You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to a very special episode of Apple Insider Podcast 139. I'm your host, Victor Marks, and joining me is Daniel Aaron Dilger. Hey, how's it going? Amazing. How are you? Well, I'm having one of those days where everything is just like upside down and backwards and <laughs> requires three more things to fix that have dependencies on other processes. No, the computing gods are that, they're conspiring against you, are they? Yeah, computing and everything else. Just <laughs> one of those. All right. But So tell me about what you have that no one else has had yet. Well, we went to the hands-on area and, and handled everything, but um, we're currently working with uh, reviews for the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus. And I don't have an, an iPhone 10 yet. I was handling one last night. I have some friends that have access to things. <laughs> so... Right. So the the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, a lot of people immediately started looking down on that and and being sort of uh, condescendingly saying that it was the fastest they'd ever seen an iPhone go obsolete. And I'm not sure I agree with that opinion. How do you feel about that? Well, Apple's doing something. Apple has a cycle of products that uh, have typically, you know, even back in the days of um, iPods, there was this sort of joke of, they've come out with a new thing and now there's something new. Like Saturday Night Live had kind of mocked that idea several times of now there's a new iPad or a new iPod that you have to buy and now there's a new one and you open it up and there's a smaller one inside of it kind of thing. Um, and with that kind of cycle of excitement, when you try to do two at once, there's a contention of, well, which is the exciting one? And Apple several times had uh, good, better, best models in with Macs and they've started doing that with iPads. They now have two iPad lines. Um, but this is the first time they've ever done that in a in a major way with iPhone, with the six seven or six six S and seven. They had the regular and the plus, which were differentiated mostly by size. There wasn't a lot of exclusive features. I think the larger one had OAS on the camera and um, more memory, but there there weren't there wasn't a dramatic difference in what they were offering in terms of technology. So the 10 is new in that it's it's offering this huge jump to a, a new premium tier. And that has caused a lot of people to look at the 8 and say, oh, this isn't this doesn't look as different. When in reality, it shares a lot of the same technology. It has the same processor, has uh, almost identical cameras that are a, a pretty big jump from the 7 line, and a variety of other features that are kind of um, enabled by the fast processor in terms of software. Uh, so... But because it lacks the the thing that people have been putting a lot of attention on, and by people I mean reviewers, a lot of reviewers have been really pushing attention on the fact that the the case hasn't changed, and they've been saying this for now every year since the six came out. Because Apple came up with a you know device form factor that didn't need to immediately change, and I wrote an article about this just recently, talking about you know who's going to buy the eight, who's it for, and kind of targeting the fact that people are reviewing with the sense that case really matters a lot. The, the case has to change every year to keep people excited. And sort of refuting that notion with facts, I mean, it's like, that's actually not true. Because if it were, <laughs> Apple would be losing sales to all these companies. You know, China is full of companies that are constantly coming up with new things. And this is not a, a new thing that's just with the iPhone. Um, this has always been the case. I gave the example of Blackberries. RIM was one of the most uh, popular and, you know, they were so addictive, people called them Crackberries. But they didn't really change. And, you know, across 10 years, it was kind of the same form factor. The technology kept improving, but it was kind of the same thing for more than a decade. And during that same period of time, there were companies like, for example, I gave the example of Microsoft's um, Windows Mobile. They were changing all the time. It was very it was very similar to Android today, where you have all these different companies just desperately trying to stand out and look different and do quirky things and experimenting with all kinds of different form factors. And none of it caught on and none of it was really appealing to customers in a way that sustained itself. And it wasn't just Microsoft or their business model because they did a similar thing with Xbox. Over across 15 years, Xbox has really changed three times in a significant sort of redesign of what it is. And so when you look at it from that perspective, we shouldn't expect the, the case of the iPhone to change every year or that it needs to. But what Apple's doing is saying, here's a, a case that's going along for a while in this design. And in the past, it has actually changed every couple of years. And that was the original kind of thing behind the S uh, cycle. They had the 3G, and then they called it the 3GS. It was the same thing, but it was improved more. And then the 4 came out, and it was totally new. And then the 4S sort of uh, built new technology on top of that same design. And same thing with the 5 and the 5S, and 6 and 6S. And with the 7, it was like, oh, wow, they're not 
arbitrarily changing the body. It's like, well, they didn't need to. And it's it's weird how there's like two uh, messages that are going on at the same time. On one hand, you have people saying, oh, the iPhone needs to, needs to change. It's boring. It has a, has it needs a, a different case design. And at the same time, you have the most popular Android models that are selling the most are the ones that are designed to look exactly like Apple's iPhone. So does it need to change or why is everyone copying it? You know, it's kind of a mutually exclusive idea. So I'm going to just give another example with Samsung. Samsung has been selling a kind of dual flagship every year where they had the, the um, standard Galaxy S that increments every year. And then they were selling the Note. It's more of like a bigger screen phone. And then they started creating two um, Galaxy S's, one that was um, the Edge, which was kind of a more expensive version with a Edge display that only lasted for, what, a year or two? And now they went to kind of copying what Apple's doing with a slightly bigger phone they call the Plus. Um, but at no point did ever, anyone ever criticize Samsung and say, oh, they have, they have the fanciest phone with a new design, so the old one is not something you want to buy. Nobody was out there writing stories, you can't buy the old one. <laughs> but, you know, for Apple, that's, that's become an established narrative, and everybody in their reviews, almost everybody, there were some reviews that were actually quite good. But the majority of these reviews focused on the fact that the design hasn't changed and tried to make that into a, a you know, they called it a big problem for the, the 8, where if it was a problem, then people wouldn't be buying. Um, iPhone is the most popular phone and has been for the last several years of not changing. So... Clearly, case design is not what's causing people to buy a new phone every year. It's the technology in terms of what it can do for them, how responsive it is, which is a, the best uh, benchmark of how fast it is, and features like the camera. It's extremely popular. And then there's other features that are related to the platform with iMessages and things like that, certainly apps that have people interested in iOS exclusively. They're not even going to look at op- uh, alternatives regardless of what features they offer, how much the case changes. What should a person who's weighing whether to get an iPhone 7 or an iPhone 8 or the iPhone 10 consider? Because those are three different, very different price points and different capabilities. But there's this sort of pulse-pull between people who think that last year's phone is good enough versus getting the, the middle of the options there or laying out all the cash and getting the very best one. What's what's the decision process that person should go through? Well, I don't think it's really changed over previous years. I mean, we've always had kind of a buy the latest model, buy last year's model for hundred dollars less kind of cycle, or you can buy an even older model, or you can buy a refurbished model. Kind of depends on how much you want to spend. Um, a lot of people think about and talk about, especially in reviews, the price of the hardware. And actually, if you you know, especially in North America, for example, um, you're paying more for data service than you are for the phone. Even if you buy an iPhone 10, you know, it's a thousand dollars. That sounds like, wow, that's a, that's a very expensive phone. And yeah, it's more expensive than we've had before, but that's something like $83 a month. And that boils down to about $2 a day. So in terms of kind of, uh, if you have the ability to afford a cup of coffee every day, then you're spending a thousand dollars a year on coffee. And a lot of us need coffee, um, but actually a lot of us have developed a need also to have, you know, the best phone there is. And when you pull it out of your pocket and it makes you happy, that's, you know, to me, that's probably worth more than a cup of coffee. But, you know, there are people that don't have money up front to pay for some of this stuff. And, you know, that it certainly makes sense that, especially, you know, if you have four kids, you can't, <laughs> you can't buy them all coffee. Um, so it, it's, it's totally a personal decision on how much you think it's worth. But I tell people to think about the terms of the cost of what you're paying for in terms of how much you use it and what you get out of it. Not buy features that you think, um, you know, that, that are being marketed to you, but decide what do you want? What What is important to you? And for some people, um, just having a, a phone for connectivity is important. Um, but for increasingly, for most of us uh, in, the, in the world, being able to access apps and being able to, to use the best camera that's possible, there are people who... You know, whether you're taking pictures of your friends or whether you have children, that you're recording their lives, the phone that you have has a huge impact on the kind of photos that you can capture and how good they're going to be. And so that's playing a bigger and bigger um, role in people's decision to buy more premium devices. It wasn't too long ago that, that you know, you bought a Palm Pilot phone or whatever, or, um, whatever your carrier gave you, and it the, the camera wasn't really good enough to take pictures with. I mean, you could sort of capture things in a utilitarian fashion. But modern iPhones have tremendous cameras that 
rival a full expensive standalone camera. And when you combine that with uh, the ability to run apps and play games, I mean, you have a multi-purpose device that's covering a lot of bases that we used to buy separately, whether it's, you know, a music player or a phone and a camera. And, you know, for a lot, increasingly for a lot of people, it's like a computer. So this year, there's been a whole bunch of noise made about the fact that Apple has a Apple selling a computer that costs a thousand dollars. You know, there was a time not too long ago when the news was that Apple has a computer that costs less than a thousand dollars. Isn't that incredible? So Good point. It's it's really. I, I don't think you can create a formula for people to decide this. This is how you should decide what to pay for. It's a very much a subjective decision. But I love paying for technology because that's one of the things that makes me the happiest to use every day. I mean, you use it so much. It's it's very similar to cars. There's a lot of people that pay more for a car than maybe they should afford, you know, if you are going to judge them. But what's the alternative? It's not one of the most expensive things you pay for. So, I mean, it really comes down to what you can afford, obviously, but also, you know, it, it's not it's not the kind of thing that is more expensive than most people can afford. Right. And, and one of the complaints that I saw said that you know, uh, anything, yeah. above, anything above $200 is a luxury. And I scratched my head and thought, well, now, wait a minute, the iPhone SE costs more than that. Does that make all iPhones luxury items? And I think what that, that kind of complaint misses is that for a subset of, of iPhone users, a subset of all smartphone users, the phone is their only form of connectivity to the internet. And that for some of them, they may not even use the browser as the portal to the internet, which it traditionally has been, that it's the apps and voice interface that are using the internet as a service, right? Asking Siri questions and getting right. answers back about weather forecasts and th events of the day kind of thing is more useful and, and more pertinent for that user than a browser. And that if, if that's their only access to the connected world, then it's not a luxury item. Right, and it's kind of a personal luxury. I mean that that's it's well, kind we of more it's a continuation more of, of iPods. I mean iPods were you know relatively expensive music players compared to you could always buy something cheaper than an iPod. But well, I would the, say that music players are definitely a luxury item. M music players are a luxury item. M music enriches lives. Yes, music is entertaining. Music is a, is a both a distraction and and something that we focus on. But the internet and its resources have become a, a critical part of life to the point where some services, uh, even even services you regularly need, like government services, are either only available or best available through the internet. Um, sure. I think this is... So the phone, it makes sense to have the, the phone that works best for you for that, right? It's, I, I would say I it's mean, not absolutely. necessarily a luxury item. It's, it's the, the iPod is more of a luxury item than the phone. Does that make sense? I mean, it's becoming more of a necessity... But, um, you know, the distinguishing line between what is luxury and what is essential has changed and shifted as time goes on. I mean, our, our world keeps getting more and more luxurious, really. But there are things that we now take advantage or, you know, take for granted. You know, television was originally a luxury, and then it got to the point where people, it was kind of a common thing. And if, if you know, you check into a motel room and there's not a, a TV, you'd think, wow, this is strange. And, you know, today I don't even notice a TV in the room. If I'm in a place, I don't ever turn it on because I have more than a television in my pocket that's going to show me what I want to watch, not what, you know, a dozen channels are wanting me to see. So the definition of what is luxury and what is needed is, you know, changes over time. But what we're seeing with iPhones in particular, I mean, iPhone, uh, Apple's leading that, uh, and other phones, you know, there are other phones you can buy, um, but Apple sort of defined what a smartphone should be and what it delivers, and they're constantly adding on to that. So instead of just being a camera, it's a video camera, and now it does panos, and now it does slow motion and time-lapse stuff. And a couple years ago, they invented this idea of live photos that it's not just a photo, it has this animated context to it that you, know, you can access. And they're building upon that in iOS 11. So now you, instead of just having a photo that comes to life, you have a photo that can be in a loop or you know a boomerang-like bounce or blurred into a photo that's kind of capturing time over a period of time, but in a photo, not a time-lapse. So and then also with all this augmented reality and being able to capture, especially with the iPhone 8 Plus and the upcoming 10, the idea that you're not just taking a 
photo of capturing light, but you're actually creating a depth map where you have either two lenses on the plus and the 10 on the back that are calculating how far different things in the picture are from you so that you can do things like change the lighting or blur out the background or and create a, an entirely different sense of what that photo is going to be. How how's that worked for you in practice? You've, you've got the phones in your hands. So how, what have you found using that? Well, I've been using uh, the portrait mode in, on the 7 Plus all year. I really like it. There are things it doesn't get right, and those Apple's continually updating that. Uh, there's been some improvement over the course of iOS 10, but iOS 11 does a much better job of figuring out how to apply like the bokeh blurring out of the background, how to determine where the edge is. There are still things it doesn't quite get right, so it's it's like any other kind of form of photography where you take a picture and it you know, there's a flaw here, or you have to make sure that there's not a intensely bright light because it's going to blow, blow out your photo, things like that. So it, it requires kind of working around its limitations. But the new lighting effects, um, I haven't, we haven't published any photos yet, but it does allow you to do a lot of things that lighting is quite difficult. There are people who, that's their job is to do studio lighting. And for, a, you know, a regular person being able to take a photo and come back with a a very dramatic lighting that not only takes out the background, but lights the, the the surface of their face in a way that's correct. Apple's kind of doing a machine learning thing where they took all these pictures and, and analyzed how professional lighting benefits a picture and then applied that electronically in, in the way that the camera is able to analyze the subject that you're pointing your camera at and give you similar um, effects. So that's a really smart way of improving a camera that's not just, you know, hey, the pixels are a little bit bigger, or I mean, the, the pixels are deeper and smaller and the sensor's bigger kind of thing. Here's a computing answer to making photos better so that you're taking the photo, but you're also have the tools to improve things on a level that's kind of beyond, you know, people say, oh, the lighting, the, the portrait lighting features, you can do that in apps. Well, that's not actually true. That's kind of like saying that the uh, Face ID, oh, you can do that with an app. That's what Samsung did. You know, they just point a camera at somebody and say, oh, yeah, that's you. Let you in. That's not the same thing. <laughs> if you're not doing depth, if you're not looking at an analyze, if you're not, if the camera doesn't have the capability and hardware to either take two copies of a photo taken from slightly different angles and compare them together to create a depth map, which is what the 7 Plus and the, the 10 rear camera do, or the the front facing sensor on the tin actually projects a matrix of invisible dots on the subject and does an even more detailed scan of what's there. Without that depth data, you can't do these kind of effects, the portrait lighting effects. Because, you know, Instagram, you can do Instagram filters that just kind of broadly change things across the photo or maybe lighten the middle of the photo or block out the, the outsides. Those effects are powerful and they're great for improving your pictures. But if you have other data, and third party developers like Instagram will be able to take advantage of that depth data that the iPhone 8 Plus and the 10 capture. If you have the ability to uh, uh, work with depth data, you can do all kinds of things with a photo that you can't just do with a, a filter. And Snapchat's another example of that, of doing it in, in real time and live. I was going to ask you about that. So what's your Snapchat experience? I worked with Snapchat, and I mean, I used it in, at the event. Um, it's pretty incredible. I mean, everybody else saw the pictures too, but you, the ability to not just add sort of a superficial um, graphics on top of your picture, but actually mapping it to your face in real time. That's right. There, totally so the, the Snapchat filters that you usually see are ones where they're, they're images that happen to be sort of stuck on top of the surface of your face. They don't map to your face. They're just images overlaid over the top of a photo, right? Right, and there's transparency, and it, and it does, you know, it can um, interact with, it can recognize your face, for example, and it knows where to overlay those things. And that's right. something that's not new to Snapchat. That's something that Apple was doing, you know, back in the days of um, Photo Booth, where you could have, like, the, the, bird, the circle of birds going around your forehead like a cartoon. Or things like that, <clears throat> where the the software is recognizing where your face is, so it knows how, how to draw, you know, the glasses on your face, or something like that. Or that's still a not a trivial thing. It's interesting to do. It's not something that is, you know, something we take for granted. But Apple but keeps what, uh, changing and building upon that. So in um, in iOS, you have a whole API for working with 
identifying things in, in you know, using machine learning or, or basically machine uh, vision so that the camera is understanding what's there. So you can identify not just a face, but you can actually identify that's where their eyes are, this is where the cheekbones and the, the contour of their chin, those kind of things where you can do not only just apply an effect to it, but also track a person in a video or there's a whole ton of things that you can do with that kind of information. And depth is another example of that. And so a lot of these things are actually taking advantage of multiple different technologies together to do you know, a whole new level of things. Yeah. And what sets Apple apart with iOS in terms of uh, being able to advance technologies like that instead of Android, because there was this whole message for, for many years at the beginning of Android saying, we have all these different manufacturers that are all trying new things and things are going to happen faster. Well, what we actually have witnessed over the last decade is that Apple being able to say, hey, this is how we want to roll out a technology and rolling it out, you know, putting a lot of thought into it first and then rolling it out and then building upon the most successful ideas has developed technology much better than having a whole bunch of different companies say, hey, we're using Android on a low level, but we're going in different directions. Just for example, dual cameras. There's been a dozen different companies putting out cameras with um, dual cameras on the back, but their implementation of it was different and it didn't really catch on. And there's not one way to do that in Android land. So for well, example, part of the problem that, that Vic Kondutra laid out earlier this year was that when you do something like that in Android land, you can either then make your own camera application or if you want to participate in everything else that Android does, then you, you have to talk to Google and get what it is that you're doing integrated back into the camera app that means everyone else can take advantage of it, which has the effect of lengthening out the timeline to get something implemented in people's hands and can in the way dilute your what, what makes your implementation unique because you've just given it to everyone else too. Right. This is part of what Android 8 is trying to resolve is, is some of that balkanization by the way they've restructured it so that you can do these things without having to go back to Google and ask permission necessarily for all of it. But this is the advantage that Apple has is because they own the whole stack from top to bottom. They don't have to ask anyone else's permission. They know exactly which devices they're going to support and how many devices are out in the wild that are still in use that will be supported on day one. They have a much easier path to go on it from and that just a, a specific example of that is that, like I was saying about dual cameras, there's LG, that their dual camera is one of them is a wide angle lens. So you get a wider shot. And there's some value to that. But uh, other companies, their idea, that the couple different Chinese companies, their idea of two cameras is one is, is, you know, kind of modeling it after the eye where you have rods and cones that are one is capturing color data and one is capturing sharp uh, monochromatic data. Uh, that's that's what Huawei have is different, doing. <clears throat> right. And honor a couple of different companies. And there's other companies that are doing other things. HTC had a, an idea of doing it more like what Apple's doing in terms of having two cameras that are using depth to, to do um, effects. But they used a lower resolution camera that just didn't look as good. Um, so you have all these different things that people are trying. However, you know, several years later, they've had a head start of a couple years of doing that, several years maybe. Um, there's now not an installed base of any of them. So they were all attempts. Now at this point, Google can't leverage any of this installed base of hardware to build, for example, AR kit on top of that, where Apple has been, Apple has a uh, pace and goal of what they're trying to accomplish. So they're rolling out hardware. And then over time, they're using the abilities that they've rolled out to uh, kind of snowball technologies. So you have the dual cameras of the seven plus. Now you can use that not only for the portrait bouquet, but you can also use it for um, other depth applications. And there's a huge installed base of them. And you can build upon that to do other things. And then on top of the fact that you already have uh, a gyroscope and motion controls and the cameras are all very similar. I mean, they're, they're, it's much easier to calibrate. You can drop something like ARKit that allows you to build very complex applications that require very precise calculations of when the, when the phone moves and the camera sees this, then it should recalculate a scene so that it looks smooth and perfect to the user. That's extremely hard to do in Android land because everybody has different hardware and it's all calibrated differently and a lot of it can't even be calibrated. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very difficult for there to be, let's say, consistent experience when the, the hardware is so different and what its capabilities are are so different. And that's partly why you end up shoehorned into each different Android developer's experience they've designed. You know, they, you, you get their modifications to the launcher screen, their modifications to 
the camera application that are preloaded. And if you want to have the experience that, that should be canonical Android, it's difficult to get. Right. And as and I say, some only, of that's supposed to be changing with Android 8, but it's still not there. And that's, that's a problem not only just across Android between, you know, HEC and LG and Chinese companies, but between companies themselves. I mean, half of Android is built by Samsung, but within Samsung, there are different brands that are achieving totally different things. I mean, they have their brand that's trying to be like Apple, especially the, the Galaxy, in terms of selling more premium hardware. But the majority of their phones are not like that. The majority of the phones are just cheap devices that they're selling that are sort of um, carrier-friendly good enough, is what Samsung called them internally. And even amongst the uh, top uh, Galaxy phones, what they call a Galaxy you know, S7 doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. There's a whole bunch of different phones with different GPUs and different uh, modems and you know, significantly different hardware. They're all called the same brand. So that's the fractionalization of what it means to be an Android phone is just like a fractal. There's no way to do this. Even Amazon, or, you know, even uh, Samsung can't do that. Okay. I want to break for a moment. I'm going to tell our readers about something very important, and then we'll be right back. Casper is a sleep brand that's created an outrageously comfortable mattress sold directly to consumers. Better still, Casper's award-winning sleep surface combines supportive memory foams and a springy comfort layer for just the right level of sink and bounce. It's, it's important to know that buying a Casper mattress is easy. You order online, it's delivered to your door in a compact box. You take it out of the box, it's wrapped up in a little bit of plastic wrap to keep it compressed. You unwrap that and it folds out and expands as the air comes back into it right on your mattress, right on your uh, box spring or, or platform. And it's really, really comfortable. They have free shipping and free returns. It's available in the US, Canada, and the UK. We spend one third of our lives on a mattress, so it's really important to sleep on a mattress before committing to it. And that's why Casper gives you 100 nights to try it out. Now, I've been sleeping on one for the past few nights, and I am surprised at just how different it is from other mattresses that I've slept on, both you know the, the variety of ones that we have in my house or in hotels. The Casper mattress, it's, it's hard to describe how different it is. It's, it's supportive. It's not exactly firm. It's got sort of the comfort layer on top, like I've mentioned. But even if you find that you get one and you don't like it, again, you have 100 nights to try it out. And if you don't love it, they pick it up and they refriend you everything. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash insider and using the code insider. Terms and conditions may apply. Now, Dan, we were talking a lot about Android and iOS 11 and iPhone 8 and 8 Plus. Uh, it, we would be remiss if we didn't mention some of the things that have happened in the news this past week. There have been a number of reviews about Apple Watch, specifically the LTE-equipped model, and some problems that people are encountering when it tries to stay associated to a Wi-Fi base station as opposed to switching over to LTE. Have you read anything about that or, or seen anything about that as we talk about it? Yeah, there were a series of reviews that some of them didn't see this problem at all, and um most notably, I believe it was the Wall Street Journal and The Verge, commented on it and not only pointed it out as a problem, but said it was a reason not to buy the watch. And that idea has been picked up by a lot of sites saying, oh, LT doesn't work, and you should hold off on buying the watch. So it's kind of turning into a Ben Gate situation. The reality is, what's actually happening is when you connect to certain Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, there are kind of free open spots, for example, like Starbucks or, you know, sometimes the the city or an airport will have a, a site that you log into and there's no password on the network. But how it works is you connect to the network and then it pulls up a web page and, and it's called a, it's a captive setup. So where captive portal. It, yeah. So you, you go to apple.com and instead of taking you to apple.com, it takes you to welcome to the airport. Please click this button to say you're not, a, you know, using our network to be a terrorist. And then you have to click OK. And so there's like this thing that you have to go through. That's one example. Another example is you go to a hotel and you associate with, you know, you're at the Marriott and you have to go in and put in a username and password that they give you or you have to put in a code or you have to do something to make it work. So those kind of networks are obviously not going to work on Apple Watch. But how Apple has set up uh, how networking works, it has this kind of magical way of any networks that you set up that, that are known networks on your phone that you can just automatically connect to it will sync over to all your other devices so that they'll just work. So these kind of networks are a problem on Apple Watch because there's not really a mechanism for making that work, especially on its own, if, it, if there's not a phone around. 
Okay. Um, if you have so can, I, can already, I restate it just a second? Yeah. So what's happening? The way this the way this works, in my understanding, is that uh, when you are on one of these networks that is a captive portal network, uh, you type in a web address. You could type in Google. You could type in Apple. You could type in whatever, and the captive portal, their router, captures that request and redirects it to their page that allows you to click that you accept the terms or put in your hotel room number or whatever the requirements are. And when you accept those terms, then it goes ahead and, and redirects you. And what they're doing is, the way Apple does this is pretty tricky. What It's very cool, actually. What they do is, when you try and connect to a Wi-Fi network and first load the page, if you can successfully get to a website that's hosted on Apple.com servers, um, the response will be success, and they don't show you the captive portal thing. You just get to keep going to the internet. If you can't reach that page at Apple.com, then they go ahead and show you the web view and show you the captive portal page, which is how Apple does this. The point that you're you're getting at is very cool too, which is that Apple has decided it's very convenient if all of your Apple devices that have your same iCloud ID signed in know the same Wi-Fi so that if you're on one device and you close it and pick up another, it will also join the same Wi-Fi network. You don't have to re-enter the credentials. And, and that so works what's really happening good here for the watch in certain circumstances. Works works great for iPad, works great for iPhones, works great for Mac laptops. Works less well for the watch when it's a captive portal that requires you to re-agree to the terms because the watch has no way of displaying those terms. And uh, in addition to what we're talking about with captive portals, there's another, um, I don't know if it's ex considered the, the same thing, but there's another little twist on it. For example, if you have Comcast or a number of different carriers, they give you access to a bunch of Wi-Fi networks. And if you set that up on your computer, it will also work on your phone so that if you happen to be around the corner from, you know, a, a Comcast hotspot, it'll just automatically jump on. And the way Comcast handles it specifically uh, limits you to a number of different devices so that you can't just like give out your credentials to everybody and everybody can just use their network. Uh, so you have to do this little setup that, you know, creates a, it involves a, um, it involves You're essentially reauthorizing which devices are yours, right? Well, it's not only that, it actually installs a, a certificate on your device okay, to be able to access it. And that allows it to just log in automatically. It's basically a, a password in the form of a file. Um, mm -hmm. So those kind of things are going to work on you know, a few phones. You know, if you have a phone and an iPod and a laptop, it works pretty well across that. But one of the issues is that's not going to work on the watch. And the other issue is um, you're going to run into a problem that I've run into where you're on a network like a free city network or one of these Comcast hotspots, and you actually do have Wi-Fi, but it actually doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work to get to the internet. Mm -hmm. And that's that can happen in a lot of places. I mean, you can have, you know, go to a motel. A lot of times you can get on their Wi-Fi, but it doesn't actually work. So when you have stuff like that configured, it's not as obvious on the watch what the problem is. It's kind of It can be kind of puzzling on a computer. Right. But this kind of explains why there were some reviewers that didn't have this problem at all versus reviewers that worked for the Wall Street Journal or The Verge who live in New York City and are very likely using services that have captive portals or, or uh, as you say, a Comcast-style uh, shared Wi-Fi, right. where they must run into this all the time because, obviously, the watch tried to associate with things that it had no way of getting through on. So this is like a little bit of a complex situation. It's not the user's fault, and it is something that Apple could... Um, I mean, they say that they're trying to figure out how to work around this, um, but it's not a situation of the watch not working correctly in terms of well, hardware. It's a situation of Apple, there's a, you know, a niche problem that if you don't understand what's happening, it appears that it's not connecting to LTE networks. And so how they reported it is that it's not, doesn't connect to LTE networks correctly, which is not really true. And it's kind of It's not entirely true. No. Yeah. Because the issue now, is that your configuration is messed up. There's a lot of ways you can right. mess up your own configuration and it makes you, oh, the computer's not working. It's like, no, well, it's had, because you set had, up a router wrong. No, but they didn't set up, you know, the reviewers didn't set up a router wrong. I'm not saying the reviewers, that's what they did. I'm saying that you can create a no. situation that it makes it appear to where the problem is here when actually the problem is over here. Yes. So it is, it is something that Apple has to address. They have to make the user interface more obvious. And that's one of the things they've been working on. For example, what you were talking about, the web-based logins of, of these captive networks, if you go to an app, there's a number of times when you can be on a network that's trying to log you in, and if you don't immediately get the web view to where you can go to a thing, you can be, it, it can say that you're connected to a network, and you can be in an app saying, why isn't it not refreshing my information? Well, it's because you're not actually on the internet. You're on a Wi-Fi network 
but that Wi-Fi network is still trying to authenticate you in a way that's not a username and password on the Wi-Fi network. It's on a different level. So Absolutely this is a problem correct. that's confusing on, it's not just the watch. It applies to other situations. And that's why Apple has created this sort of captive mechanism for getting on. I believe right now one of the problems is that there's no way to distinguish, um, at least for the user, to say, hey, this is a network that I want to connect to on my iPhone, but I don't want it to connect, try to connect to my watch, for example. There's no way right. to differentiate. And in fact, it's not even clear on iOS how you set the order of which networks you want to connect to in what order. So in some cases, your your house has access to multiple networks. You, you may have your neighbor's Comcast as a thing that you could log into, you know, on, on this shared network, but you'd rather be on your own because it's going to be faster. Yeah. And you want to be able to prioritize which network your thing connects to. And so there, there needs to be a little bit more sophistication in terms of how you do that. But that's these are kind of like complex problems to solve, and it yeah. might not work for everybody. Well, so creating because... something that just immediately works out of the bin for a mobile device like Apple Watch that's mobile on a different level. And the fact that it's not like a phone that can just be on the mobile network all the time. You don't want your watch just constantly on the mobile network because that's, you know, it has a battery that's the size, you know, tiny. So you want to be as efficient as possible. I, I see a possible so solution for to Apple to, <laughs> to solve this. I, I do see a way that it could be solved that makes sense. And, and the answer is that just as when you first join the network on a uh, on an iPhone, and they test to see if you can receive this page at Apple or if you get redirected. And if you get redirected, then they so show the captive portal page. What they could do is on the watch, check to see if they can reach the same URL and get the success, success results. And if they can't get the success results, instead of you know blowing up and not being able to display a captive portal page at that point, simply just disassociate from that Wi-Fi network. So you can have that Wi-Fi network in your iOS device and in your laptop, but your phone will, your, your watch will reject it because it can't get to the success page. Right. And I would, I would like that to happen for a number of things. It's like, if a network isn't working, either try to reconnect. There's a number of times where I'm roaming on T-Mobile and I don't know if it's a problem specifically with T-Mobile or what, but I will travel far enough to where all of a sudden my phone says it has LTE and good service, but I can't go anywhere. And if I turn it on and off again, it reestablishes a connection. I don't know if it's just a failure in being able to hand off the, data service or if it's a problem in iOS or what it is. But that's something that the operating system should say, hey, this isn't working. I'm going to, you know, turn it off and turn it back on again. <laughs> the classic <laughs> troubleshooting technique. And the oh, same yes. thing like what you're saying with Wi-Fi networks. If you're connected to a Wi-Fi network and it's not giving you a route to the internet, that's a pretty easy problem to solve. You just say, can I get out? I can't. Well, let's turn it off. And can I get out now? Oh, I'll use LTE. So, I mean, that, that's something that already works to an extent. And the, the handoff between Wi-Fi and LTE on mobile devices like the iPhone is pretty impressive. However, there are new things on the watch. And it's not that it doesn't work. It's that, you know, there's a configuration that needs to be sorted out. So it is kind of irritating to, to read these articles saying, oh, Apple doesn't have a watch that works on mobile networks correctly. And it's like, well, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And you're telling a story that's confusing people with misinformation. And if we're really clear, right, all of this is going to get sorted out fairly rapidly. We're, we're, we can predict there's going to be a software update that will rectify this problem relatively quickly. Right. We just posted an article on how to weed out your Wi-Fi, your bad Wi-Fi networks to work on your phones on Apple Insider. Excellent. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes so everyone can go check it out. So we, we've talked a little bit about the, the iPhone. We've talked a little bit about the watch. What about using iOS 11? You've been using it not just on your, your iPhone 7, but also on the 8 and 8 Plus that you've got there. So what are the most striking changes, the things that you're taking advantage of, and the things that you've noticed about iOS 11? One of the subtlest things is when you turn on your phone, instead of the, the screen just coming on, or I think previously it sort of came on slowly, it actually comes on from black. It goes from black, kind of repaints the image. I mean, that's not like a cool thing of iOS 11, but I just noticed there's a lot of little tweaks and animations and things that Apple has put in that kind of blur. They're not obviously software. I mean, so, some things, Apple has always kind of used animations to make things feel smoother and more kind of natural and organic. Um, you know, the original Macintosh, when you open an application, it would do this very simple sort of wireframing of a rectangle just to give you a sense of, oh, that's what's happening is it's, it's expanding and now you have a window open. And uh, so there's a lot of cues of how things are happening or, you know, an application that kind of scales down to go back to an icon. Uh, those kind of animations create a feel that uh, is 
somewhat unique to Apple. And if you look at Android devices, you don't have that. You have this kind of like brittle sort of jumping between things. And Windows Mobile is kind of the same same way. You know, when you, when you flip your orientation, instead of the screen sort of animating, so it's like, oh yeah, it's flipping over, you have this sort of glink and then it glinks back in another way. It, it's very computery and PC looking that um, is not nice. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I've been kind of noticing with iOS 11 that's, you know, unique, apart from the obvious new things. Do you have any special features that you like? <laughs> you know, I one of the things that I interacted with all the time in iOS 9 and 10 were Control Center. And I, I used them for a lot of things. Do not disturb uh, setting up, up home and home kit controls and also turning on and off Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, airplane mode. And there's something about iOS 11 that has changed these things for me a little bit. They pretty radically changed Control Center. And there's some things that are easier to do, and there's some things that are like, who moved my cheese kind of thing. Yeah. So with the turning on and off of Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and, and now cellular control in Control Center, when you tap on those, formerly in iOS 10 and before, they would actually disable them, the same as if you'd gone to settings and turned Wi-Fi off and turned Bluetooth off. And now they don't have that behavior. Now you have to go to settings if you want them absolutely off. Here, what they do is they disassociate you from whatever you're repaired with. Right. And there's, there's a good reason for that is because a lot of people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize that the magic that they're seeing with what Apple brands is continuity, where you do like app handoff and airdrop and things like that. They don't realize that those are in the background using Bluetooth to discover things and then using Wi-Fi to send data. So, there's a number of reasons why you'd want to say, hey, I don't want to connect to my devices anymore. I want to like unplug everything. But you don't realize that when you're doing that, you're also turning off an essential technology for a lot of things that are happening. So if you're actually wanting to turn them off, you go into settings and say, turn these things off. But when you go to control center and you say, turning off Wi-Fi, it means I don't want to connect to this network, but I don't want to lose my wireless connectivity with things that are around me. So when I you know, go up to my Mac, I can still see the document that I'm working on or the email is still ready to go there. And so it, it doesn't shut off uh, enabling technologies, but it, it control center, what it's showing you is you're not turning off a, um, it's not like airplane mode where you're saying, hey, I need to turn off all my wireless because wireless networks may be interfering with things around me. It's, I want to disassociate with the wireless network that I'm on because I want it to use LTE, like on your phone, for example. Mm -hmm. But doing that doesn't mean that you want to lose the connectivity of um, AirDrop and other features like that. So it's really making it simpler for users that don't understand what's all that's happening in the background, but they want something to happen. Yeah, but it seems like it's a much more nuanced thing to try and explain now, where where in the past it was very simply an on-off toggle. So that's that's well, uh, one of always, the things that I've noticed. It's always been a nuanced idea. Yeah. And so the, the way that the changes they've made there, um, it accomplishes something that, a user doesn't have to understand everything that's going on to realize if they do that, they're achieving what they want to do in control center, mm -hmm. but they're not losing functionality that they didn't realize is essential to what they've turned off. Got it. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. The, uh, the one of the things that I'm happy about is the idea of shared iCloud storage among family members. That's handy. I haven't looked into exactly how that's implemented. <clears throat> But that has um, been something that people have been asking for for a while. Well, and, and Apple's cloud storage offerings have always been compared to the obvious Dropbox offerings and, and Google's Drive offerings. And the uh, ability to have a, a family account and shared family storage makes sense from the standpoint of, you know, if you have four devices in your house, for example, and or, or even six because people have iPads in addition to phones, and you want to have them all backed up. Buying individual storage for each one was kind of a mess to manage. Yeah. So being able to to go ahead and purchase for all of it makes a lot more sense. Um, and it's one of these things that I've intended to set up in the past few days, and I have yet to do it, but I'm going to today. It's another thing uh, that people have asked about. Set up is shared, for example, sharing pictures between people, like a husband and wife or a family. You're taking pictures and you want to share things. There's kind of a complexity of there's some things you want to share and there's some things that you don't want to share. You don't want to have uh -huh. like all your kids' pictures just dumped into your photo album. And there's other things that maybe you're taking a picture of you're going to get someone a present or something and you don't want them to know. Um, so how do you 
how do you share things like that? And so having a shared pool of data where you actually have an individual account and you're explicitly sharing things uh, seems to make a lot more sense to me. What Google demonstrated at I.O. this last summer was this idea that if you take pictures on your phone, they're just automatically shared with people who are in them, which seems like a terrible idea. Because there's a lot of times when I post a photo that Facebook or whatever algorithm thinks that somebody in the picture is somebody else, or um, you might have a picture of somebody that you don't want them to see because it's not a good picture. So this automatic sharing <laughs> thing. It's when not they a flattering show picture. Just, yeah, it's like, you don't need to share everything. Uh, you certainly don't want a machine sharing things for you. Um, so it, it does seem like Google has incredible technical capabilities that they don't filter through any sort of human filter of really, you know, just because you can do something yeah. doesn't mean that you should do it. <laughs> yeah. So just, just as the public service announcement for our listeners to share your iCloud storage plan, if you go to settings and you tap at the top of the page and then family sharing, and then tap iCloud Storage. A banner will pop up letting you invite family members to share your storage. And if a family member already has a storage plan, they'll be given a choice to join your shared plan. If they're on the free tier, they'll just be automatically added. And that's really all you have to do. The The 200 gig plan costs $3 a month. The two terabyte plan costs $10 a month. And so for, for basically just these few bucks a month, you really end up with a lot of storage that should cover the backup for most of your devices. And especially if everyone's using iCloud Photo Library as well. It's a good thing. And I, I'm glad that it's that easy to do it. So it's, it's not hard. It's settings. It's, uh, it's, it's just that few steps. What device are you going to purchase? I mean, we, you've got the iPhone 8 and the 8 Plus in your hand. What personally is Dan going to be walking around with? I'm going to get an iPhone 10. I mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody who loves everybody technology. who's anybody is getting an iPhone 10. Well, it's not, Didn't it's you not know? That, it's not that you're just anybody, <laughs> but it's like if you appreciate technology, yeah, this is like such an obvious leap. Um, but I have circumstances. You know, I don't, I don't have a bunch of kids that I have to buy iPhones for. So um, I have. It's kind of like a duh, obvious thing for me. I mean, like, yeah, of course, I've I've always been on the bleeding edge just because that's part of my job that to write about stuff and understand what's going on. But yeah, I mean, it is uh, very much a jump. And what we're seeing this year is Apple is really expanding the range of iPhones because they've never sold a cheaper iPhone. They, they lowered the price again of the SE. And then now they're selling four generations of phones in addition to the SE. You know, typically it was they were selling three. And then I think there was one year where they only sold two, like this year's and last year's. I, I, it's not right in my brain right now, but um, this is the broadest a range of phones. So people have been talking a lot about, oh, the $1,000 phone. It's like, well, Apple's been selling a phone that's been $950 for several generations now, the, the high-end plus. It's not really incredible that Apple's selling a $1,000 phone. What's incredible is that Apple's now selling a $1,000 phone, $700 phone, a like $600 and, you know, $550 phone, and, you know, down to whatever the lowest one is now. That's an incredible range of options. So people can kind of decide for themselves where they want them buy a phone. But what we've always seen in the past is the best phone that Apple's had is what majority of its customers buy, which is kind of incredible. That's not the case for anybody, any other company on earth, certainly not Samsung. You know, Samsung has 80 million phones a quarter or something, but a very small number of those are, um, you know, a small percentage of those are its best phones. Where Apple, you know, Apple has always came up with, you know, like the 5C and, and the SE and other phones that are kind of budget oriented, that's not blowing up the majority or the volume of its sales. Those are actually kind of, you know, almost niche products for people who want to spend less. The majority of people buying iPhones are always buying the newest model. And that's changing a little bit. I mean, it, it, the last three years, you know, Apple's, you could say the plus is the best model because it's the most expensive, but there's a lot of people that just don't want that big of a phone. It's hard to carry. It's, it has a nice screen, but it's hard to carry. Uh, so I think the 10 is going to appeal to a lot of people that like the idea of a really nice screen that's larger, but is not much different in size than the, the standard iPhone 8. Um, and price is less of an issue because people are already paying a lot of money for data service, you know, at least in the United States. Right. How things will translate into other countries and different regions. I mean, Europe is, has a different idea of what people value. And also the data service isn't, um, is priced a lot differently. And in emerging countries, it's even more different. And, you know, in Asia, there's different, you know, there's China, Asia, and there's um, Japan. And th 
right now the the mix that people buy is different in each of those markets. And then like within China, there's totally different markets. There's the markets for affluent people live in cities, where there are tons of people that are rich and live in cities or you know have money to spend. That that's Apple's market. And then there's a huge market outside of that that uh, can't immediately afford you know even a six hundred dollar phone, and especially when you apply taxes and other you know things. It, it's quite expensive for somebody who's making less than a comparable, you know, like Western salary. So a lot of the talk about how Apple's slipping and falling and, you know, their market share is going down is really, they're looking at a big market outside of iPhones that are not buying an iPhone priced device. But Apple's really held on to the, the, the market for phones, uh, premium priced phones, or like 80% of that in China, which is kind of incredible. Because there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of Chinese companies that are trying to build high-end phones as well, but they're just not able to compete against Apple's branding and product. And Apple has a really strong ecosystem, so it'll be interesting to see how that yeah. works out. And then also, you know, what happens next year? And that's kind of a cause for speculation. Do does iPhone 10 become a separate line from the standard iPhone, or do we just sort of? I believe what's going to happen is we're going to, you know, just incrementally become iPhone iPhone 10 as a new platform of how an iPhone looks and works. Well, I, I agree that the notch and the face ID are, are pretty much the standard going forward. The, the only reason that I'd expect to see a touch ID, for example, would be on the SE or, or on the seven, if it gets sold for one more year in the same way that the success has been sold for one more year. Right. You know, any, any new product is going to be a product that has the notch that has face ID, that has these things that we call that the, the things that make a 10 a 10. Um, That's the product the naming gets a little weird for me, though, because we've got the 8 and the 10. So next year we get the 9 and the 10.1, or or how's that work? It's going to be weird to me. Yeah, I mean, it kind of doesn't matter because product names are sort of arbitrary and people get upset. Sure. Remember when the, the MacBook <laughs> first came out, people were like, no, it's not a MacBook, it's a PowerBook for the rest of my life. And then, you know, now we're used to calling it a MacBook. It doesn't really matter what they no, call it. It's the same. It doesn't. You know, it's the product that matters. Uh, but, yeah, it is kind of interesting to speculate how things are going to work out. But if you look at, for example, how Touch ID rolled out, there were phones that, you know, devices that came out, you know, the, five, the, five the 5C, which is sort of discontinued. But um, there were, you know, Touch ID took a while to roll out to everything else. You know, certainly iPads uh, kind of incrementally became a thing. And, you know, most recently it came to the Mac. Um how, how quickly Apple will roll out its technology for iPhone 10 on other devices. There's applications where you could put that on a computer, you know, Macintosh and an iMac have a sensor array in there to do those kind of effects. However, there's something really powerful about the fact that iPhone sells in such huge quantities. It's hundreds of millions of devices in a year, every year, consistently. And that allows you to do things you can't do on a platform like the Mac that sells 20 million and, you know, different form factors. How do you account for the difference between how a person uses a desktop iMac and a laptop? Yeah, even if they were relying on the exact same part as used in the iPhone, it, it still would have costs on fitting that part into the device, right? Changing the screen frame, changing the... Uh, the the overlay glass around the whole thing it's, it's it would have a knock on effect that would have a cost that you wouldn't necessarily recoup on and Macs just the, don't have the same uh, the economy of scale that's they just the don't have the volume thing, same thing you see in uh, in the App Store it the Mac App Store is good for what it does but the, there's certainly not the same volume of sales that's driving the kind of rapid um, business that you see in the iOS Store well and the Mac the App Store has its own problems. Yeah, I mean, that's a frustration for developers. But, I mean, part of the problems, part of the reason those problems aren't being so, uh, solved as rapidly is because there's just not as much activity there to address yes. it. And Absolutely. one of the interesting things about having an engine like the iPhone that's just driving development technology is that there's a lot of spillover. So people complain about how the Mac hasn't adopted all these technologies as rapidly as iPhone. But the fact that it, it is getting them, it would never have been able to get those things on its own. But the fact that there's so much development going on for iOS means the developer tools that are also used for Macs are also progressing on this rapid level. And you're getting things like Swift and you're getting, you know, compiler uh, advances and things like that that are really being paid for by the iPhone in a large respect. I, another company the size of Apple couldn't, you know, the size of the Macintosh couldn't maintain a platform like the Macintosh without having a product like 
iPhone. And, yeah. you know, look at Microsoft. That's part of their problem is they're trying to sell computers that are sort of like a Mac. They're selling them in much lower quali- quantities than either the Macintosh or iPad, much lower. They just can't iterate as fast and they can't develop it as fast and they can't invest as much technology in as Apple can because Apple's not only making so much more money on its Macintoshes, but it's also you know making money on the side in terms of iPhones that reuse a lot of the same technology. If you're a cloud services company, you can't just do that. When we were leading up to the release of these devices, we had a lot of rumors that showed uh, the dock that was on iOS 11 and iPad rendered on images of the iPhone 8 and 10. And one of the things that came up among some friends and I that were talking was that iOS 11 for iPad makes iOS 11 on iPhone feel like the iPhone is the older technology because it lacks the dock and because things like drag and drop aren't nearly as, as let's say, um, you know, they're, they're, they're more like first seasons on the iPad where the iPhone feels like a second cousin kind of thing. Well, uh, Apple has developed iPads and iPhones separately from the beginning. And that's how they positioned it. When Steve Jobs introduced the iPad, he didn't say, hey, here's a big iPhone. He said, True. here is the iPhone and here is our desktop computers. And we think there's a space in the middle where we can develop a product that's different from both, that's better at some things, and has a reason to exist. <clears throat> and everyone sort of blew that off. And Google's approach was to say, hey, we have an operating system that scales infinitely from you know, a tiny device to a huge, you know, almost a computer. Uh, and that has failed. Android tablets have never been really strong uh, platform. And basically they run stretched out iPhone apps or stretched out Android phone apps. And that's hurt its adoption as well. Because what's the point of it? It's just like kind of stretched out. And it's enabled things. For example, it enabled Samsung to make big iPhone or big um, tablet phones that are sort of a huge screen. to just scale everything up. But it's had the, the impact of um, erasing any capacity for Android to really become a strong tablet platform and it's they've introduced things that sort of don't work on a tablet or don't work on a phone and what Apple's doing with iOS 11 is they're putting a lot of a lot of new emphasis on iPad and saying hey we're solving a lot of things that you kind of need to make iPad a more sophisticated device and taking advantage of its screen even better to do complicated things and, you know, to do multiple drag and drop kind of operations and work between applications in a way that's distinct from a complex windowing system like the Mac, which is much more complicated and and requires um, a different way of thinking about things, but is also not really something you can scale down effectively to an iPhone. So you don't really want an iPhone to work like a scaled down iPad because you don't have as much real estate to work with. Some of those features, there, there may be some more blending in the future, but I think there's, there's really boundaries that say, if your screen is you know, this big, if it's an iPad size, and I think that's part of the reason why they got rid of the iPad mini, because it's, it's, it's making kind of a clear sort of fire break between this is what an iPad is and the kind of size you need to be able to work with it you know, significantly with multi-handed gestures. You can't do that if you scale it down too far. It's just like what Steve Jobs said, you know, you can't file your fingers down. There's a scale to what we work on that if you're doing things that are tablet oriented, they have to be a big enough screen. And what we've seen with the iPad Pro is that Apple said, yeah, you can actually have a bigger screen. If you look at the iPad Pro by itself, the 12 inch one, it looks like an enormous iPad. And it's like, wow, this is just too big. But when you start using it, especially when you start using it with a pencil, you realize, wow, this is just a perfect screen for doing a lot of things that would previously require a whole desktop computer setup. But a lot of those things don't scale down to having something that fits in your pocket. And that's that's really the, the conjecture here is that there are people that believe that they do. And, of course, they believe that as, as an unproven kind of thing. They, they, it's their hypothesis. I can kind of see both ways of it. Once you get a, used to doing drag and drop, once you get used to doing these kinds of things, you kind of want for them to be there on the iPhone. And it doesn't work the same way. That can seem frustrating. But there, uh, there's some things I, that I may, may change it's... in the future. But remember, there was also kind of a strong parallel in that a lot of people who are familiar with the desktop computer were saying, oh, when is Apple bringing win- overlapping windows and a, a 
well, desktop full of floating now, icons. And we're, a lot we're of finally that getting not... an iPad that begins to work like a computer, that begins to work like the, the what we think a computer should be able to do. Yeah, but and if with... you had just made the iPad like the Mac, it could not have uh, changed, it, it could not have optimized in the way that it has. And it would also be much slower because the, the, a windowing environment takes much more um, processing capacity because you have to do a lot of things. You're, you're doing a lot of things that are wasting processor power that if it, you're on a computer, it doesn't matter because you have a huge, huge fast chip and a big battery. But if you have a super slim tablet, you have less computing power to start with. And as you start adding computing power, and the, we've seen how the, the A10 and the A11 just turned into just incredible powerhouses of, that are rivaling laptops at this point. Now you can start doing more complicated things. But if you started off with that, you would have had a really slow computer. And that's what Microsoft really showed, was if you have a tablet that is actually a PC, without a keyboard basically, it's either going to be too thick and heavy because it's really a computer, it's not a tablet, or it's going to be super slow, or it's going to pretend to be a PC, but when you actually do PC things on it, they're not work because it's not really a PC. So Apple's approach, which was very different, and you know people were saying, oh, you know, I don't believe this, I believe that. It's been a few years now, and we have pretty good proof of what worked and what didn't. And Apple has a very strong platform for tablet computing that's differentiated from its platform for handheld uh, phone devices and from its platform for computing on a conventional Macintosh-type environment. Microsoft doesn't have any of those things. Microsoft is struggling to sell laptop hybrid computers, and every other PC maker is also like barely making any money, struggling with these kind of things where the screen comes off or whatever, you know, appeals to like a niche group of people. It does not appeal to a huge mainstream. It does not allow people to do unique things that they weren't able to do before on a level that, you know, is really changing technology. It's pretty clearly answered. Apple got this right. So, I mean, at this point, it's like we're not really arguing. We're, we're looking backward and saying, see, that that was correct. <laughs> you know, Apple's approach was correct because <laughs> it worked. Yeah. I, I want to thank you for your giving us all this time, and, and I appreciate it. So I, I don't want to draw things out very longer, very much longer. Is there something that you'd like to leave with us as a parting thought? Uh, what is a parting thought? Let's see. Hmm. I'm trying to think of something brilliant to say. Um, I think we've had a, a period of time where people were saying, oh, man, this technology is getting boring. It's not boring right now. There's so much going on. There's so much excitement happening in, in the world. And we're seeing Apple's really hitting its stride. Um, there, there's been this kind of media narrative that, oh, Apple can't innovate anymore. It doesn't know what to do. And, you know, they're, they're not changing their case fast enough. Anyone who's saying that Apple is not innovating fast enough is, it's kind of hard to take them seriously at this point. I mean, it's like, come on, do you not understand what technology is? There are companies that are coming out and, and doing flashy things that are, you know, employ a lot of impressive technology and research and development and, and stuff. But we're not seeing a lot of examples of things that are really successfully uh, taking hold of the market. I mean, one example is, you know, Samsung's Edge phone. There, there's quite a lot of technology that goes into taking a screen and bending it around the corner so that you can touch it on the side and you can have it upside down and look at, you know, the side lights up. But that wasn't, it was gimmick. And it's kind of obviously a gimmick in the fact that Samsung doesn't make that anymore. You know, they did that for a couple of years and it was like, okay, we're done doing this gimmick. We're going to move to something else. That kind of gimmickry gets a lot of attention from the media and gets, you know, excited reviews and people are standing up clapping. But it's gimmick. It's not real. And there's some things that Apple do that are also kind of gimmicky. But overall, the, the pace of technology that Apple's doing, a lot of things that appeared to be sort of gimmickry in the past are now clearly like, wow, that's foundational. You know, Touch ID, there were a lot of people that said, oh, fingerprint reader, that's, that's been done before. You know, Microsoft's licensees were putting fingerprints on their fingerprint readers on their phone and, you know, gave up after a year because it didn't really work out. Apple established that as being so essential that when they came out with a new technology that's even better with Face ID, that people are saying, oh, you can't take this fingerprint away from me. You know, I desperately need it as part of how I work now. So it's really, it's really good. I try to always have kind of a historical context of are what people saying right now, does it fit into the continuity of what we know to be true from previous events? Or are they saying something that contradicts everything we actually know? I think that's something that's always kind of fueled how I look at things. And it's a it's a functional way to look at things. Does this fit into everything else that I know? Perfect. Where can people find you on the internet? I tweet stuff out at Apple, um, no, at Daniel Aaron. <laughs> E-R-A-N is my middle name. 
And of course, I'm on Apple Insider. And I've been writing about a lot of these new technologies. Um, wrote about Face ID and what it means, kind of what I just talked about. And also, some of the new technologies we're writing about depth uh, cameras and what that means. So there's a lot of interesting technologies, AR kit, all the stuff that's coming out, Apple Insider. We also have, Very of cool. course, our YouTube stuff and our app on the App Store. And of course, this podcast on Apple Podcasts. And we would appreciate it very much. If you've enjoyed this, if you've enjoyed talking and listening about this with us, please give us feedback. Please uh, tweet either Daniel, Daniel Aaron, or me at VMarks. And uh, feel free to let us know. Feel free to leave good reviews about both the Apple Insider app and the Apple Insider podcast. We do appreciate it. And we will be back next week with more.